Okay. Hi, good evening, friends. Uh, this is Dr. Rajiv Dhawan, your ENT faculty with Dr. Wills, and this is Clinical Thursday. So Clinical Thursday is uh, one of the, you know, like uh, activities we are doing on the YouTube channel of uh, Dr. Wills to make sure that we get a lot of, you know, clinical integrated questions and discussions so that our medical, you know, junior friends start thinking on the line the question is being asked actually. If you see the MCQs are turning more clinical, more integrated, be whatever exam it may be, maybe FMG exam, NEET PG exam, INICT paper, or the upcoming future next paper, which will be full of integration. So let us do 10 clinical scenarios in our uh, subject of ENT. What are the things which they can ask, where we can get confused, and what are the relevant questions around that? So without wasting any time, I would request all of you to take a copy and pencil or pen and write some salient feature of whatever you are really, you know, going to, you know, uh, grasp in these 30, 35, 40 minutes. And please inform your friends also. They can also join and really we can have a good learning session over here. Now, the, the first clinical scenario. The first clinical scenario, a lot of time you will see this word, Christmas, hot, red voice, plummy voice, dysphagia. A lot of time these words are there. And we always get confused, what is the right diagnosis, okay? Now, guys, Christmas is difficulty in mouth opening, hot potato voice, plummy voice, and this is sometimes also called muffled voice. Along with some difficulty in swallowing, we get over there, okay? Muffled voice. Now, please see, this is the first question about these three features, the Christmas, plummy voice, dysphagia, in a patient with oropharyngeal picture given in the image. This is a very common visual question also of the paper. And this image is very commonly given in addition to the clinical history of the patient, which is like having dominated difficulty in mouth opening, patient is unable to swallow, and the voice is very plummy or hot potato or muffled voice. Now look at this picture. In this picture, the uvula is pushed to the other side and tonsil is pushed medially. There is no mention of any other clinical finding in this patient. Okay. Now this particular patient would go for the diagnosis would be quincy or peritonsillar abscess. Look at the name peritonsillar, the, 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 the pus is collected between the tonsil and its bed. If you remember, the bed of tonsil is made by superior constrictor muscle. So basically, the collection of pus is here. The pus is collected between the tonsil and its bed. The bed is made by superior constrictor muscle. And this is pushing the tonsil medially and pushing, pushing the uvula on the other side. So very clinical diagnosis, Quincy beta, peritonsillar abscess. Now, my dear friends, always remember that in Quincy, there is no outer neck swelling. Oh, no outer neck swelling. The only dominant feature is the you know plummy voice and trismus. And why trismus happens? That the trismus in Quincy is due to spasm of medial pterygoid muscle. I repeat, trismus in Quincy is due to spasm of medial pterygoid muscle. And neck is absolutely normal. There is no mention of any dominant neck swelling with that. Okay, fine. There may be small lymph node here and there, but that's not a neck swelling which patient would really come to your clinic with. Now, there is another patient in which like this. If you see Quincy-like clinical picture, the same kind of picture, like Trismus is there, plummy voice is there, dysphagia is there, but along with that, the outer neck swelling close to angle of mandible, this angle of mandible, close to angle of mandible or close to sternocleidomastoid muscle, then the answer will not be same beta. Because in Quincy, the neck is normal. If Quincy type history and clinical finding are given in the oropharynx, along with that, there's outer neck swelling close to angle of mandible or close to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, then the answer will shift over to parapharyngeal abscess beta. Please look at it. The trismus, plummy voice, and dysphagia in a patient with neck swelling close to angle of mandible. Close to angle of mandible, the patient would go for the, not the question looks very similar to Quincy, but because internal picture is similar. Along dominant clinical finding is there is a neck swelling close to angle of mandible in this patient, and this is a case of parapharyngeal abscess. This is a case of parapharyngeal abscess. And please do remember a famous equation number one of ENT Quincy MCQ. The MCQ is of Quincy. Everything is Quincy, like Trismus is there, hot potato plummy voice is there, dysphagia is there, uvula is pushed to other side, tonsil is pushed medially, everything is same. Plus outer neck swelling. Quincy does not have any dominant outer neck swelling. 
Quincy plus outer neck swelling is equal to parapharyngeal abscess is a very common, you know, confusion in the multiple choice questionnaire and there also no need of any confusion. I know these two questions are differential diagnosis of each other, but if you keep the clinical finding in mind that there's a neck swelling in parapharyngeal abscess, rest all features are similar to Quincy, we'll go for the answer of parapharyngeal abscess in this case, parapharyngeal abscess in this case, okay, guys, the whole idea of scoring better in the paper is Please see the differential diagnosis. Please see the clinical picture of the patient and see this versus this. Okay. Now, let me take another one. Guys, whenever you do the paper, be very careful. There, is, there are similar sounding words. Q-U-I. You know what? Sometimes they give a choice. Quincy and Quinque. Quinque is not Quincy. Beta. Quinque is not Quincy. Quinque disease is angioneurotic edema of uvula. It is angioneurotic edema of uvula. It's uvular edema. Can you see over here? Uvular edema. Uvula is not pushed to other side, beta. Basically, Quinque and Quincy should not be confused in the paper. And these kind of things you will only know if you do practice of multiple choice question in medicine, surgery, OBGY. There are similar words which are rhyming words like that. An examiner might choose one word as a choice A to confuse you, and the, the, that may be a wrong answer, beta. Okay, fine. I always tell the story in the class also. In Jaipur, I wanted to go and book a cab to reach jam hell and unfortunately due to my you know clumsy brain i typed j a on the app and uh, the uber and moment i booked it i booked it for jal mahal i had to go to jam hell j a i jam hell and i read jal mahal because human brain works like that we take things casually when we know the topic we get super confident about it and in that moment only we do silly mistake like i did a silly mistake i had to book a cab for Jam hell, but I booked the cab for Jal Mahal because Uber suggested me first option, like drop down was Jal. So I, I really actually did that. But you don't do this when we know the brain makes these kind of mistakes. We will not make the similar mistakes. Okay, fine. Now, dental infection can give two clinical scenario based question in ENT. Beta. Dental infection can cause two types of swelling. Beta. Dental infection causing swelling close to angle of mandible or close to sternocleidomastoid muscle or dental infection causing chin swelling. Chin swelling. Okay, this is chin swelling. Now, both patients will have trismus. With them. So, don't, don't think tris, dental infection causing trismus and a swelling in the neck has only one diagnosis. No. Dental infection causing trismus and swelling close to angle of mandible or sterogramestoid will be again parapharyngeal abscess. With them. Parapharyngeal abscess is the diagnosis. Okay. It means that it's not a dental infection Okay, has only one possibility. Dental infection causing trismus and chin swelling is Ludwig's angina. Ludwig's angina, both story can start from dental infection. Read the question carefully. Both stories can have dental infection as the primary cause. Both patients will have trismus, but the nature of the site of swelling will be different. If dental infection is causing a swelling close to angle of mandible or close to sternocleidomastoid muscle, it's parapharyngeal abscess. And dental infection causing chin swelling will be trismus. Better. Look at parapharyngeal, lateral to pharynx. Of course, better. this is pharynx. This is parapharyngeal space. Of course, swelling will be here. And this is chin swelling. Better. Okay, fine. Okay, so Ludwig's angina. Better. Okay, why? Basically, what happened, better? the tooth got caries and the infection came over. Ludwig's angina. And I hope you remember, Ludwig's angina, the bacteriology is mixed. Better. Mixed bacteriology is streptococci plus an aerobes. Better. In Ludwig angina, another microbiology question is streptococci plus an aerobes. Better. Okay. So this was the first clinical scenario in which we discussed about the different type of abscesses and this thing so that you get confident about it. Better. Okay. Fine. Now, second clinical scenario. It's a rapid session. Be fully available. Forget everything. Let's learn. Let's refine. Let's sharpen our skills to answer clinical questions of ENT. The second clinical vignettes which they create is with the nasal crusting, bad smell, roomy nasal cavity. Now, a lot of times these words are there in the MCQs and we get confused. What is the answer? Better? There are two multiple choice questions possible with the same clinical words used. Better. First question. A female patient with a female patient with roomy nasal cavity, nasal crusting, and bad smell from the nose. Okay, female patient, roomy nasal cavity. Any guesses, Bitta? Any guesses in the chat box? Everybody, can you try, Bitta? Everybody, can you try? What is the answer of this patient, Bitta? What the answer is? Yes, atrophy rhinitis, also called ozena, which is more common in females. And wherever you see the word ozena, think of atrophy rhinitis. And the causative organism which is implicated is Klebsiella ozenae. 
Okay, so bad smell from the nose is coming due to crust, but the crust cause big problem. Roomy nasal cavity, but the cavity are full of crust and the crust give bad smell. That's the bad news. But the good news is patient has anosmia. Wow, patient say smell aati hai. Wo tumhari problem hai. Patient ko koi smell nahi aati beta. Kya? Patient emits bad smell, that's your problem. But patient says, I don't have any sense of smell left. Beta. I can't smell anything. Patient says smell aati hai, tumhari problem. Patient ko smell nahi aati. That's a good news for the patient. Thank God there's anosmia. Need PG, FMG question. This is called merciful anosmia. Beta. This is called merciful anosmia. My dear friend, this is called merciful anosmia. Okay? Okay? To remove this crust, we know you do alkaline nasal douching. You wash the nose with the solution which you make with the alkaline nasal douching powder better. And that contains three things: sodium bicarbonate, sodium biborate, and sodium chloride bitter. The components of alkaline nasal douching powder are sodium bicarbonate, sodium biborate, and sodium chloride. Bitter. The three components over there. Okay, that's the multiple choice. Where is the triad? Triads are the possible multiple. All are component of alkaline nasal douching powder except so sodium bicarbonate, sodium biborate, and sodium chloride. Beta. Keep revising, be mentally available. It's a rapid round to sharpen our clinical skills. Beta. What are the surgery surgeries done for atrophic rhinitis? There are three surgeries beta, which are mentioned in the literature at Young's operation, modified Young, and Luton's Slager operation. The most popular one is modified Young's operation. Young operation is not done these days. It has been converted to modified Young. So what is modified Young? DPG, FMG question, both. The answer is modified Young operation is very important question, visual question also. It is the permanent partial closure of both nostrils. Basically, you make the nasal entry half bitter. Permanent partial closure of both nostrils bitter. Permanent partial closure of both nostrils. Look at me, beta. You may put a stitch over here, close the close the this entry gate half. Permanent partial closure of both nostrils, and that's going to really help us by decreasing the air entry. You decrease the crust formation. Don't forget, modified Young's operation is the surgical treatment of choice for atrophic rhinitis. Young's operation is not done nowadays, beta. Now, the other clinical scenario, I told you the clinical words are roomy nasal cavity, crust formation, bad smell from the patient, but they can create another multiple choice question. So what is the other question? A patient with roomy nasal cavity, nasal crusting, foul smell from nose and hard external nose. This finding was not there in atrophy rhinitis beta. The extra finding is hard external nose beta. Hard external nose is the extra finding over there. And the answer to this question is rhinoscleroma or woody nose. Rhinoscleroma or woody nose beta. Woody nose. Rhinophyma is potato nose. Rhinophyma was hypertrophy of sebaceous glands beta. Scleroma, but the hard woody nose. Huh? So guys, look at me beta. There is equation number one of ENT was Quincy like MCQ with the outer neck swelling close to angle of mandible. The answer is parapharyngeal abscess. Equation number two of ENT beta. Atrophic rhinitis MCQ plus hard external nose. The questions are overlapping. This is called differential diagnosis. This is what the clinical vignettes are. This is the future of the next paper is also a bit like that. They're going to create a lot of clinical scenarios for you. But if you know the science, you know the science better. Don't worry about it, okay? And the current paper of NEPG, FMG is also tilting towards that big time. The answer is rhinoscleroma. So let's revise two multiple choice equations of ENT. Quincy plus outer neck swelling is equal to parapharyngeal abscess. Atrophy rhinitis MCQ plus hard external nose equal to rhinostroma, also called woody nose. And this is called by Clepsella rhinoscleromatis. Clepsella rhinoscleromatis. And this disease is more common in Uttar Pradesh and Rajasthan, north of India. Uttar Pradesh and Rajasthan of India. Why the disease is similar to atrophy rhinitis? Because the first stage of disease is atrophic stage. The second stage is granulometer stage, and these this lead to multiple granuloma formation in the nose. Beta. These are granuloma formation. Okay, so this is the granulometer stage. Beta. The first stage is the atrophic stage. That is why the question is overlapping with the atrophy rhinitis. Beta. And the third stage is stage of fibrosis. Now, my dear friends, how to prove it? You have to take a biopsy and send it for histopathology examination. And if you see the histopathology findings, the famous question is. The two typical histopathologic findings are Russell bodies and Mikulis cell. Russell bodies and Mikulis cell, beta, these blue cells, beta, these blue solid 
blue plasma cell like inclusion bodies are vessel bodies and the please see over here but these large vacuolated empty cells are micullus cells once again beta vessel bodies are plasma cell like blue inclusion bodies and micullus cells are the large vacuolate cells and what are these rods beta these rods are beta these are the bacteria klebsiella rhinochromatis beta rhinochromatis beta my dear friends okay what is the treatment of choice of uh, rhinochroma beta tetracycline and streptomycin my dear friend what is the drug of choice for the rhinochroma it is actually infection by klebsiella rhinochromatis so drug of choice is a combination of tetracycline and streptomycin if these do not work second line of drug is rifampicin second line of drug is rifampicin okay second line of drug is rifampicin rifampicin okay now let's go to the third clinical scenario be available with me keep writing your concepts over there beta so that we score the best out of the you know ent question in the in the upcoming fmg the neat pgi and sct paper also beta okay now third clinical scenario very famous question child with respiratory distress inspiratory strider fever hopper of plummy voice drooling of saliva dysphagia again this is a clinical story created in you know two three clinical scenarios in ent okay but if i find child with respiratory distress inspiratory strider fever plummy voice or drooling of saliva dysphagia now guys my dear friends this kind of story basically it's a pediatric airway emergency please see beta this is a pediatric airway emergency child is 2 year 3 year 4 year old and the patient has got the strider also difficulty in breathing also now there are two possibilities in this patient the the same clinical scenario but two questions two question can be created out of this and both are pediatric airway emergencies the two possibilities are famous one acute epiglottitis which is the bacterial infection of supraglottis beta and second is acute retropharyngeal abscess matlab behind the pharynx beta what is behind the pharynx vertebra beta what is behind the pharynx vertebra now look at me this is pharynx what is behind me behind the pharynx what vertebra okay vertebra so there are two possibilities a 2 year old child with difficulty in breathing with strider drooling of saliva refusal of feeds dysphagia think of two possibility acute epiglottitis versus acute retropharyngeal abscess my dear friends x ray would be given over there beta in epiglottitis they give you thumb sign thumb sign and in retropharyngeal abscess x ray they will be showing you widening of pre vertebral shadow widening of the shadow beta pre vertebral shadow both are airway emergencies in both first treatment is airway management but how would you differentiate the question on the x ray beta please see x ray can you see over there this is the acute retropharyngeal abscess beta this one this one okay this is vertebra in front of vertebra can you see the widening of pre vertebral shadow this is the abscess beta. look at me beta retropharyngeal the behind the pharynx what is behind the pharynx vertebra so behind the pharynx in front of vertebra this is the abscess beta this is the abscess my dear friend this is the abscess beta this is the in front of vertebra beta. this is the abscess pus collection over there this is the pus collection what is the color of pus on x ray not yellow we don't get eastman x ray in india at least beta okay fine please see not not nowhere in the world even the pus looks white in the x ray that's why the technical word is widening of pre vertebral shadow but what is the x ray finding for epiglottis is of course thumb sign beta can you see thumb sign over there that the thumb sign beta fine so my dear friend please see the first yellow arrow the yellow arrow can you see yellow arrow this one this is widening of pre vertebral shadow and this is the first diagnosis second is thumb sign acute epiglottis once again let's revise my dear friend if they ask you question child is dying two year three year old child with the airway problem with inspiratory strider then fever drooling of saliva plummy voice think of two possibilities acute epiglottitis versus acute retropharyngeal abscess and if you remember in the class we discussed that the pharynx and supraglottic problem cause inspiratory strider and that's why inspiratory strider word is there beta okay fine the x ray finding are different retropharyngeal abscess will lead to widening of pre vertebral shadow and acute epiglottitis will lead to the thumb sign beta both treatment in both is airway management beta don't try to give antibiotic don't drain the abscess first my idea of treatment will be airway management first why airway management because this patient is having 
severe respiratory difficulty and it's a pediatric airway emergency duo. Those, these two, two cases. Did you see what we're doing as a clinical vignette, beta? What is the future of the paper? The current paper also, beta. Quincy versus parapharyngeal abscess. Then parapharyngeal abscess versus Ludwig's angina. Then we did atrophy rhinitis versus rhinus chloroma. Then we did acute epiglottitis versus acute retropharyngeal abscess. This is what the clinical vignettes are, where they can confuse you, beta. Okay, fine. Now, let's go to clinical scenario number four. Okay, now, 28-year-old female with bilateral gradually progressive hearing loss. Guys, my dear friend, whenever a female patient comes with young age over there, pregnancy age and all that, with bilateral gradually progressive hearing loss, only one diagnosis comes to my mind as an ENT clinician is otosclerosis. The first possibility, I'm not saying the first possibility for the MBBS students would be, for your exam will be any young lady with bilateral hearing loss, beta, will be otosclerosis and I'm sure you know it's conductive hearing loss. Why is, what is otosclerosis? Stapes acts like a piston, beta. Stapes acts like a piston. Look at me, piston-like movement, move at the oval window, stimulates the cochlea. But if this piston gets fixed, beta, can you see otosclerosis, beta? Please see, there is extra bone formation. Basically, there's a bony issue over there. Around the foot plate area, the, the, the stapes is going to get fixed over there. Stapes is going to get fixed over there. And the otosclerosis is this one, beta. Basically, it's a disease of otic capsule, beta. If it is otic capsule, the dense bone is replaced by spongy bone, beta. And the initial color of disease is pink, beta. Initial color of disease is pink, beta. And that state is called otospongiosis. And gradually, it turns white, beta. Okay, so the, in the initial stage, when the bony change is spongy, that stage will show Schwartz sign, beta. Schwartz sign is seen in the early stage of disease. And it is flamingo pink appearance behind tympanic membrane. Flamingo pink. This one is a flamingo pink appearance behind tympanic membrane. If short sign is positive, the pinkish hue is there. It means disease has just started. In this case, if short sign is positive, then drug of choice is sodium fluoride. The drug of choice is sodium fluoride. And sodium fluoride leads to stabilization of disease. Beta. So otosclerosis can have two questions. Beta. The treatment of otosclerosis in general or treatment of choice for otosclerosis with Schwartz and positive, which is early stage of disease. We don't do surgery. We go for sodium fluoride. Okay, sodium fluoride is the drug of choice. It's the oral medicine we give and it is supposed to stabilize the otosclerosis progress. Okay, guys, it's a gradually progressive disease, but pregnancy aggravates it. Look at the question, beta. patient has got bilateral, gradually progressive conductive hearing loss. Gradually progressive hearing loss. But one clue they give in the exam is pregnancy aggravates it. Beta. Pregnancy. Any question like that, beta. a lady has bilateral hearing loss, she turns pregnant and the hearing loss increases. What is the most probable diagnosis is otosclerosis. Beta. Otosclerosis. Beta. Now, look at everybody. So short and clear, beta. never forget Carhartt's notch. Beta. Carhartt's notch is typical audiometry finding of the otosclerosis. First of all, otosclerosis causes conductive hearing loss. Beta. Everybody remember in the class we discussed that conductive hearing loss, there is A, B gap. Guys, please see, beta, this is bone conduction line, the air conduction line. Beta. Upper line is bone conduction and lower is air conduction. This is A, B gap. Beta. Whenever you see A, B gap, this is indicative of conductive hearing loss. Beta. Okay, but fine. There is 2000 hertz dip and otos in the bone conduction curve. This is called Carhartt's notch. Beta. So Carhartt's notch to revise, it's a dip at it's a dip at 2000 hertz in bone conduction curve. Dip at 2000 hertz in bone conduction curve, that is called Carhartt's notch. That's called Carhartt's notch. So Carhartt's notch is a dip at 2000 hertz in bone conduction curve. And this is very important audiogram to be remembered by you. Okay. Don't forget that otosclerosis, conductive hearing loss. AB gap shows conductive hearing loss. AB gap, matlab conductive hearing loss. And 2000 hertz dip. And bone collection curve is Carhartt's not otosclerosis. Treatment of choice is surgery. Beta. The best surgical name is stepidotomy. What is the first step? Stepidotomy. The second best name, the second best name is stepidectomy. Stepidotomy or stepidectomy. My dear friend, this is malleus. Beta. This is incus. In this surgery, please see, in this surgery, we have replaced the fixed stapes with artificial stapes piston prosthesis. Beta. This is artificial Stapes piston processes, and this looks like a question mark, my dear friend. 
this look like a question mark okay this looks like a question mark anything like a question mark in ent as a visual question in neat pg inict please mark it stepy's piston processes okay so the best name of surgery is stepy.me the second step is second best name is stepidectomy in this basically you, the first step of the surgery the first step of surgery of either of these beta the first step of surgery is tympanotomy first of all open the middle ear tympanotomy second step is replace the fixed stapes with artificial stapes piston prosthesis beta. okay fine now let us go to the fifth clinical scenario we have done the four clinical scenarios to the fifth one this was otosclerosis a young lady with bilateral hearing loss which is which is gradually progressive pregnancy can aggravated initial color is pink in color if shorts and is positive sodium fluoride otherwise treatment of choice is surgery the best surgery is step it dot me okay now sixth scenario a very popular question in all the papers beta be it inct be it need pg fmd paper this is a golden question beta golden question six year old child the history of mouth breathing is there beta. mouth breathing is there has mild hearing loss okay okay fine the otoscopy finding given in the image and what is the most likely diagnosis but this is a platinum question of ent beta very popular question in fmg need pg inct all of them beta. whenever you see air bubbles behind the tympanic membrane think of glue ear beta think of glue ear also called as otitis media with effusion okay glue ear also called as otitis media with the effusion beta otitis media with the fusion my dear friends okay that's my dear friend whenever you see the glue ear whenever you see the glue ear please it's very easy question to diagnose it is very easy question to diagnose how because there is always history of hearing loss with glue behind tympanic membrane and if you cannot see glue no problem can you see air bubble trapped behind the tympanic membrane when you see air bubble trapped behind the uh, depending on in the glue air bubble behind the membrane in a child answer is glue ear beta let us not put too much of you know don't become neurosurgeon some people become neurosurgeon and they ask the answer not glue ear well, glue ear lagayenge, then they change it to pneumotympanum beta why to go for common things are asked commonly rare things are asked rarely when we answer common things are rare we lose the marks beta okay why glue ear is so important beta you know glue ear is the most common cause of hearing loss in children what is the most common cause of glue ear beta? Adenoid hypertrophy. That is why this child has got mouth breathing beta. Let's go to the question again beta. Again, please see. Six-year-old child, adenoid is the problem of children. Adenoid hypertrophy is a disease of school age children. And mouth breathing is clear-cut hint for adenoid hypertrophy beta. Mouth breathing with hearing loss in a child. Mouth breathing with hearing loss in a child. It's adenoid hypertrophy with glue ear. The new name of glue ear is otitis beta effusion how to diagnose glue ear is air bubble trapped behind the tympanic membrane and this look of the child is called adenoid face what will this go adenoid face the look of the child is called adenoid face but adenoid face what the look of the child called adenoid face beta okay what is the treatment plan beta the treatment of this patient is adenoidectomy adenoidectomy plus maringotomy Maring got me plus grommet insertion, grommet insertion in the anterior inferior quadrant. Maring got me, you give a cut on tympanic membrane, you suck the glue out, and you put the grommet over there. What is the other name of grommet? Middle ear ventilation tube. How to remember the glue needs grommet. G for glue, G for grommet. Glue ear is the primary indication of grommet insertion. So grommet will stay there for some months and then body will extract it out. Body will push it out. Beta. So adenoidectomy with maringotomy with grommet insertion. Whenever you see a white ring like thing in tympanic membrane, what is the visual answer? Beta? The answer is it's a grommet. Beta. It's a grommet. Now, look at this question. Beta. The typical question of your paper, six-year-old child with history of mouth breathing, mal occlusion of teeth, conductive hearing loss due to glue ear. What is the best management? Beta? A me no maring got me no with decongestant antibody no the correct answer adenoidectomy with maring got me and grommet insertion very commonly asked need pg inct fmg question but answer is d answer is d in this case beta. okay that's what the clinical scenario based questions are beta. get ready beta. don't over dissect beta. don't be casual in the paper don't be over dissective in the paper also medium approach go with common diagnosis okay central theme of question is matching my concept stick to the answer beta. okay why Fine. Now, this is the normal endoscopic picture of pediatric nasopharynx. This is the child. 
and this is adult widow. Yes, adenoids disappear by 20 years of age. My dear friend, this is normal adenoid tissue. This is the eustachian tube opening. There is no adenoid in adult widow. A child getting blue ear, is, I can explain very easily. There is adenoid hypertrophy. Can you understand what the adenoid got hypertrophied? It blocked the eustachian tube. I can very much understand. There is no adenoid beta. If adult gets a glue ear beta, if adult get a glue ear, it can be a problem. That's what the MCQ is asked in the paper. Everybody look at the screen beta. Let me tell you another question of glue ear beta. 50-year-old patient with unilateral conductive wearing loss. 50-year-old, not child beta. And the problem is unilateral conductive wearing loss with the cervical lymph adenopathy. But this is again a star question. Beta. Why? Again, it's glue ear. Beta. This conductive wearing loss is due to glue ear. But a child getting glue ear is not a news beta. Adult, 50-year-old adult getting one-sided glue ear, I need to be suspicious. What I am suspecting? I am suspecting nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is more common in China. Anybody, tell me in the chat box, beta, which virus is implicated? Beta? Everybody write in the chat box and let me see if you remember the class or not. Guys, which virus is implicated for nasopharyngeal carcinoma? Epstein-Barr virus causes nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Okay, NPC, but everybody. NPC arises from, if you remember the class, beta, NPC, this time, you know, I need PGNSD question also, beta, Fossa of Rosenmuller. Fossa of Rosenmuller, beta. Fossa of Rosenmuller was visual question this time now in the paper. If you remember the need PGNSD paper, Fossa of Rosenmuller, beta. This is the use taken tube opening. They had put an arrow over here, beta. This is FOR. Fossa Rosenmuller. This Fossa Rosenmuller is the site of origin of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. It's a fossa just above the eustachian tube opening. My dear friend, please see, a cancer is starting from here. A cancer is starting from here and very silently it will cover the eustachian tube opening and that will lead to unilateral glue ear. That is why a child getting glue ear is not a new spitter. Adult patient, 50-year-old adult patient getting unilateral glue ear, I have a doubt the patient may be suffering from nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Okay, but fine. Now look at this. This is a hidden cancer. This is a hidden cancer. The cancer is actually forming behind the nose. Nobody can see. Very silently, this will metastasize to the neck bone. Oh my goodness. This will lead to metastatic cervical lymph adenopathy. Metastatic cervical lymph adenopathy. So very famous question. What is the most common clinical presentation of nasopharyngeal carcinoma and for nasopharyngeal carcinoma and for neck beta. It has to be neck. The answer is metastatic cervical lymphadenopathy or secondary neck node beta. So most commonly patient will come like this, my dear friend. Oh, Dr. Dhawan, I have got neck swelling over here. Oh my goodness. There's a neck swelling over here beta. Okay. Then I do what beta? FNAC, fine needle SP cytology. The report comes at squamous cell carcinoma metastatic beta. Metastatic. Then I get, oh my goodness, this is a unknown cancer, unknown primary, occult primary, hidden cancer. The cancer is here, beta. Without your knowledge even, it got metastasized to this area. That is a very famous question of your paper is most common clinical presentation of nasopharyngeal carcinoma is a metastatic cervical lymphadenopathy. Beta. So I told you, it's a very hidden kind of cancer. Some people come with unilateral conductive wearing loss due to glue here. Okay, please look at screen, beta. Now read this question. Your paper, this is a typical need PG NSCT question. 52-year-old adult patient presenting with right side hearing loss has been subjected to audiological investigation and diagnosed to be a case of right side serous otitis media. This is glue ear. Other name of glue ear is serous otitis media. Okay. What is your priority in the management? My priority is not grommet insertion meta. My priority is to rule out nasopharyngeal carcinoma because I am suspecting NPC nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So I will not go for C beta. Please mark the answer A. Go for the spirit of the question. A child getting glue ear is not a news. 52 year adult patient getting unilateral glue ear is a news. Why? I am suspecting nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So my priority is not glue ear management like grommet insertion. My priority of management is to rule out nasopharyngeal carcinoma, I must go for nasopharyngoscopy and biopsy in this patient. And biopsy in this patient. Very good. And biopsy in this patient. Okay, fine. Very good. Now, everybody, let's go further. Six good. Now, six clinical scenario, my dear friend. Six we done five scenarios, six good. 18-year-old boy with nasal mass, profuse epistaxis, cheek swelling, proptosis, 
remember the class beta young boy adolescent boy with nasal mass and profuse bleeding from the nose with other symptoms like cheek swelling proptosis this is jna beta juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma jna juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma that is what the a young boy with nasal mass and epistaxis i know it's a juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma and i know the tumor is benign locally invasive tumor and it is originating from sphenopalatine foramen and it's a most common benign tumor of nasopharynx it's a locally invasive tumor it can go into orbit also and that causes proptosis proptosis lead to frog face deformity frog face deformity beta can you see proptosis beta there's don't confuse frog face deformity with adenoid face beta adenoid face is open mouth beta but eye is normal frog face deformity is typical of angiofibroma if the eye is protruding out proptosis is there without okay, fine proptosis the tumor can go to cheek also i repeat it's a benign locally invasive tumor of nasopharynx highly vascular tumor beta and it can go to nose cheek orbit and brain also beta cheek swelling can also be there now read the question again beta 18 year old boy it is typically seen in young adolescent boy mostly it is seen in 12 to 16 beta but it can be 17 18 also beta don't worry little bit of variation that's why 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 did not write 16 years so that you know little bit changes there don't change the answer because of that my dear friend don't change the answer because of that because examiner is a very senior doctor he is a professor head of department he has seen many cases and he knows not just your book he knows multiple cases over there beta okay that's why for minimal change get the spirit of the question not for nitties and gritties change the answer over there beta so 18 year old boy purposely i wrote beta why thoda bahut little bit changes are there beta okay with nasal mass bleeding from the nose cheek swelling proptosis another you know proptosis is the frog face deformity cheek swelling is also there beta okay fine now biopsy is contraindicated biopsy is contraindicated beta and the cct shows holman miller sign beta okay please see this is the axial ct and contrast and ct this is normal side beta this is maxilla this is the disease side beta. can you see the red tumor this is a red tumor the red tumor is actually pushing the posterior wall of maxilla forward can you see this is normal side beta. normal side is different beta the posterior wall of maxilla is at the normal level beta tumor pushing the posterior wall of maxilla forward is called holman miller sign and let's define it beta. c ct contrast and ct shows Holman Miller sign in angiofibroma. It is the tumor pushing the posterior wall of maxilla forward. Beta. Can you see the red arrow? The tumor is pushing the posterior wall of maxilla forward. It's also called anterior bowing of posterior wall of maxilla. Biopsy is contraindicated. Apart from CCT, we can also go for angiography. Beta. Angiography. And my dear friend, for INICT need PG question, angiography shows the most common artery to supply angiofibroma is maxillary artery. Beta. Because it's actually it's behind the maxilla, na? So which artery is the most common blood flow tumor is maxillary artery and this will be shown on angiography beta. So angiography will show the dominant blood flow of the tumor is maxillary artery and we do what with a pre-operative embolization. Pre-operative embolization of this artery will help us during the surgery there will be less blood loss. Pre-operative embolization of this artery will reduce the blood loss during surgery. Beta. Okay fine. And treatment of choice of angiofibroma is surgery beta. Now let us see this question beta. 15 year old male child present with right sided nasal mass, profuse epistaxis. Beta. Again, male child, nasal mass, epistaxis. Now, whatever finding are written are due to clinical experience of the patient beta. Okay. The, the examiner, sorry. Hyponasality of the voice, findings suggestive of conductive hearing loss beta. You know, cheek swelling. Why conductive hearing loss? Again, it's a nasopharyngeal tumor. It can also cause glue ear. Na? Okay. Fine. So don't change the answer for extra symptom written. If central theme of my question, young male nasal mass perfuse bleeding is matching with my concept then the answer is angiofibroma beta. don't change the answer for extra finding written over there because the examiner is a very senior professor over there beta. he will be writing additional rare symptom also now seventh clinical scenario beta. total clinic 10 are there beta it's a rapid fire round to illuminate your brain with a lot of you know dds in your mind what to think how to think and all let's go to seventh one beta. the two vascular tumor in ent one goes to males one goes to females. So that is no disparity. Okay, beta. The two second vascular tumor is one is angiofibroma belong to young adolescent boys. The second one is glomus tumors, beta. How does the question come? Glomus tumor present 45 year old female or 40 year old female or 50 year old female, no problem, with the pulsatile tinnitus. 
and bleeding ear mask with hearing loss with a lot of other thing written no problem main thing is please see it's a female patient with personal tinnitus with bleeding ear mask the answer to this question is glomus jugular beta glomus jugular it's a highly vascular tumor my dear friend it's a highly vascular tumor let us let us make a concept beta highly vascular tumor there are two vascular tumor of ent one belong to males one to female angiofibroma is a tumor of young adolescent males glomus tumor is a tumor of females both are highly vascular in both biopsy is contraindicated both are benign both are locally invasive so beautiful beta in angiofibroma glomus tumors there is similarity beta both are highly vascular in both biopsy is contraindicated both are benign and both are locally invasive only difference glomus is seen in female beta the keyword is any we see very simple question beta a young boy with nasal mass and epistaxis is angiofibroma a lady with something pulsating or bleeding in the ear is glomus question beta glomus question my dear friend okay now please see it's a highly vascular tumor and you you do angiography and the most common blood supply for the tumor for inict question beta is ascending pharyngeal artery my dear friend for angiofibroma the most common blood supply of the tumor is maxillary artery for glomus tumor the most common blood supply is ascending pharyngeal artery beta ascending pharyngeal artery okay now this is the you know tumor growing over here beta okay see beta everybody please see the tumor is right below the floral middle ear over here jugular bulb is here beta the tumor is a highly vascular tumor it is a locally invasive tumor it grows into the middle ear from below upward beta into the hypotympanum area and this is called rising sun sign what is called beta rising sun sign beta when tumor enters the middle ear from below upward this is called rising sun sign beta within few months it's a locally invasive tumor it will erode the tympanic membrane and grows into the external auditory canal also as a red bleeding mass beta as a red bleeding mass okay beta fine so let us see the rising sun sign beta so rising sun sign is a feature of glomus jugular because the red vascular tumor is growing into the middle ear from below upward why the tumor is growing growing from the glomus cell lying around the jugular bulb because jugular bulb is below the floral middle ear beta okay so red vascular tumor is growing into the middle ear from below upward it's appearing as if sun is rising from the floor and this is called rising sun sign very soon the tumor will grow into the external auditory canal also over here now if you do segalization beta okay so what is segalization what is segalization putting air pressure on tympanic membrane if you do segalization the tumor blanches on segalization what is blanches beta pale if you put air pressure beta what is segalization putting air pressure on tympanic membrane if there is a red vascular tumor here if you put air pressure segalization the red vascular tumor actually blanches matlab it turns pale this is called brown sign beta brown sign so rising sun sign brown sign they belong to glomus tumor beta okay now few special point about glomus for inict need pg it's a skull based jugular foramen tumor beta it's skull based jugular foramen tumor beta it's a glomus jugular where is the jugular bulb at the jugular foramen beta and that's a part of skull based beta and my dear friend for your irs with nepg it's a type of paraganglioma the other example is pheochromocytoma so basically it's a it's a ent cousin of pheochromocytoma it's it's a same group tumor as pheochromocytoma is and that is why they 10% of the glomus tumor secrete catecholamines catecholamines just like just like pheochromocytoma beta and i hope you remember for that we do one test called 24 hour urinary 24 hour urinary vma level 24 hour urinary vma level venereal mendelic acid level so whatever test you do in pheochromocytoma is also done in glomus jugular so that you remember glomus jugular is a sister ent cousin of pheochromocytoma so similar to them these tumor can also secrete catecholamine in 10% cases so that's why we do the 24 hour urinary vma level in this tumor also it's a skull based tumor okay but fine at the skull base you see phelps sign beta phelps sign please see at the skull base this is your jugular foramen this is your carotid canal beta skull base got two holes over there jugular foramen carotid canal are neighbor and there is a bony septum which separates the jugular foramen from carotid canal the tumor belongs to jugular foramen beta. it's a locally invasive tumor and it erodes the bony septum between the jugular foramen and carotid canal and the tumor grows into the carotid canal also this sign is called phelps sign what is phelps sign it is erosion of bony septum 
it is erosion of bony septum between jugular foramen and carotid canal tumor is locally invasive tumor tumor belongs to jugular foramen tumor erodes the bony septum between jugular foramen and carotid canal and that's called phelps sign bro phelps sign okay that called phelps sign bro guys there another word with glomus glomus tympanicum glomus tympanicum bro this is similar tumor to glomus jugular but only thing is site of origin is different glomus jugular arises from jugular bulb area glomus tympanicum arises from glomus cell lying around the promontory promontory what is promontory promontory is a projection of cochlea on the medial wall of middle ear what is middle ear other name tympanum that's called glomus tympanicum so let's revise beta glomus tympanicum is similar to glomus jugular the only difference is site of origin is different glomus jugular arises from the jugular bulb area glomus tympanicum arises from glomus cell lying around promontory what is promontory promontory is a projection of the basal tone of cochlea on the medial wall of middle ear but the other name of middle ear tympanum that's why it's also called glomus tympanicum now let us see this question beta this is this is the question of typical inct need pg question all are clinically applicable statement to glomus jugular except please don't miss these word beta except okay interlesional bleomycin standard therapy erosion of carotico jugular spine yes why this is called phelps sign beta that's the phelps sign okay it's carotico jugular the septum between the carotid canal and jugular foramen eroded beta more common female yes and brown sign on pneumatic otoscopy what is pneumatic otoscopy segalization beta the other name of segalization is pneumatic otoscopy beta okay guys interlinear bleomycin has no role beta the answer to this question is a interlinear bleo the treatment of choice is surgery beta but bleomycin injection has no role in this beta bleomycin injection has no role in this okay that's a beta okay fine okay, now another question beta 39 year old lady presented with ear mass there is a clinical suspicion of glomus jugular beta which of the following no, will not be the list of planned investigation for this patient beta cct yes angiography yes vma level yes because 10% of tumor secrete catecholamine just like pheochromocytoma biopsy is contraindicated beta d is the answer beta biopsy is contraindicated beta we never biopsy we never biopsy angiofibroma we never biopsy glomus tumor also so we do cct for phelps sign we angiography will show ascending pharyngeal artery is the most common blood flow tumor and urinary vma level for secretory nature of the tumor because they can secrete catecholamines also beta eighth clinical scenario eighth one long standing history of foul smelling ear discharge maybe blood stain plus minus blood stain beta most of them they don't write about blood stain but foul smelling ear discharge for last 5 6 years the typical diagnosis is unsafe csm or atico enteral csm there's moment to see chronic foul smelling ear discharge it's unsafe csm or atico enteral csm and the hallmark of disease is presence of cholestoma beta cholestoma is the pathology and the diagnosis is unsafe csm the presence of cholestoma is a technical disease called the unsafe csm or atico enteral csm it's pearly white in color beta and most commonly cholestoma form in the upper part of the tympanic membrane okay let's see beta blood stain foul smelling chronic ear discharge with otoscopy finding given in the image need pg question beta what is the diagnosis beta you know it's cholestoma 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 but these kind of cholestoma are primary acquired cholestoma this is the most common type and they form due to retraction pockets and retraction pockets are mostly seen in the upper part of the tympanic membrane so if you see this kind of picture it is cholestoma but what type of cholestoma it's primary acquired cholestoma beta primary acquired cholestoma now right. there is four mcq of unsafe cs so beta chronic ear discharge with beta please see beta chronic foul smelling everybody write down beta four mcq beta chronic foul smelling ear discharge is the primary problem beta. with number 1 vertigo if vertigo is there beta the answer is labyrinthine fistula labyrinthine fistula is a fistula of the lateral semi circular canal lateral semi circular canal beta vertigo second mcq beta second mcq beta okay edema on mastoid edema mastoid pain on mastoid and 
प्रफ्यूज ईयर डिस्चार्ज थिंक ऑफ मैस्टोडाइटिस मैस्टोडाइटिस एडीमा ऑन द मैस्टोइड पेन ऑन द मैस्टोइड प्रफ्यूज ईयर डिस्चार्ज थिंक ऑफ मैस्टोडाइटिस थर्ड वन थर्ड वन बेटा हेडेक spike fever with the pitting edema on mastoid with pitting edema on the mastoid this these two questions are very similar beta but there is no headache in number 2 beta headache spike fever with pitting edema on the mastoid this is sigmoid sinus thrombosis sigmoid sinus thrombosis beta कॉम्प्लीकेशन ऑफ अनसेनिक फाउल स्मेलिंग इयर डिस्चार्ज विद इफ वर्टिगो इज गिवन The diagnosis labyrinthine fistula of the lateral semicircular canal. If edema on the mastoid, pain on the mastoid with profuse ear discharge is given, is mastoiditis. But if they give headache, spiky fever, with pitting edema on the mastoid, these two can be confused. But if you know there is no headache in the first one, the answer is sigma sinus thrombosis. Okay, and headache with convulsion, think of brain abscess. Better. Headache with convulsion, think of brain abscess. Better. Okay. Now, please read this question, sir. A patient of left aticoantral CSOM with headache, vomiting, apparent fibula. This is brain abscess question. Please see the aticoantral CSOM is unsafe CSOM with headache, vomiting, apparent fibula, convulsion, brain abscess. The treatment will be neurosurgery. Better. This is the very famous question of need PG. Better neurosurgery. Okay, neurosurgery is the treatment. Neurosurgery. Better. Okay, brain abscess will go to neurosurgeon. Better headache, vomiting, apparent fibula, convulsion. Think of neurosurgery. Better. Now. Read this question carefully, brother. Mohan, 22-year-old male, gives history of right side ear discharge, foul smelling for last six years, brother. It's unsafe to hear so, brother. Okay, fine. Now, for last three days, patient has developed fever with chills, headache, pitting edema of the mastoid, brother. Please see pitting edema mastoid, and the main thing is headache, brother. Headache. Now, my confusion is A, D, C, or D. Is, is it C or D, brother? Anybody? You tell me, brother. It is C or D, but it cannot be meningitis. It is not brain abscess. Okay, whenever the headache is were there, they think of brain problem, brother. Can you tell me, brother, what is the answer of this question, Mohan? What is the answer, brother? Is it mastoiditis or sigmoid sinus thrombosis, brother? Yes, it is sigmoid sinus thrombosis. The correct answer. And now, brother, now you are getting point. What is clinical vignettes, brother? Differentiation of two overlapping diseases. That's how we score better in the paper. Get a lot of clarity like that. Brother. Do a lot of question. You know, wonderful, brother. The answer is not mastoid because, just say we read edema or mastoid. Oh, it is it is mastoid. No, no, pitting edema on the mastoid. If you remember, this is called Grissinger sign. Remember, brother, Grissinger sign is seen in stigma and thrombosis. What is Grissinger sign? This is pitting edema on the mastoid, brother. Okay, and the answer to this question is stigma and thrombosis, my dear friend. Now, nine, ninth clinical scenario, the second last one, brother. Very very easy to diagnose. Everybody can you diagnose? But a forty year old female patient with brief episode of vertigo on changing head position. Can I answer, brother? Everybody can I answer? Forty year old female patient with brief episode of vertigo on changing head position. What is the answer, brother? What is the answer, everybody? What is the answer? B P P V benign proximal positional vertigo. What is B P P V benign proximal positional vertigo, brother? Okay, brother. Fine. What happened in BPP? Brother, look at this. Brother, what happened in BPP? This is your saccul. This is your utricle. Brother, they have got macula. Macula is the sensory end of utricle saccul. Macula is covered by gelatinous layer, which contains what calcium carbonate crystal, and they get out of this gel and they go to the canal. Mostly go to which canal? Posterior canal. So basically, what is the cause of BPP? The otoconia or otolith, otoconia or otolith, they migrate from utricle saccule to the semi-sacral canal, mostly posterior canal. Okay, how to diagnose it? The patient say, Doctor Dhawan, whenever I change the position of my head, I feel 
vertigo for a few seconds. I don't have any hearing loss. I don't have any tinnitus. Only pure nausea, vomiting, vertigo. That's all. Vertigo always has nausea, vomiting a little bit. How to diagnose it with a Dix-Solpeck maneuver? Dix-Solpeck maneuver is the diagnostic test of BPPV. It's a very famous question. And this is the visual question of your paper. How to see D for Dix, D for double bitter, double. Double bitter, two pictures are there. Can you see what are the two pictures? Two picture bitter. One is sitting position, then lying down bitter. You moment to bring the patient head down, there is vertigo and nystagmus also start coming in the eye. This is the diagnostic test of BPPV. How to treat the BPPV is apple maneuver. Let us send the otoconia back better. Otoconia the particle repositioning maneuver. Apple, how many letter apple has? E, P, L, E, Y. Today only one student told me this better. Apple, kaise hata? Dick Solpike, two position. Two position better. Dick, D for double, two position. Okay. Apple, how many words are in letter apple? E, P, L, E, Y, five position. Sitting to lying down to turn the head to turn the body and sit up again. Apple maneuver is sending the otoconia back from where they came. So two visual questions of your paper. Identify the maneuver given in the image. Everybody, can you identify the maneuver better? Can you tell me what is the answer of this question? Identify the maneuver in the visual given in your exam question. Better. The answer is Dick Solpeck maneuver. It's a diagnostic test of BPPV better. And identify this maneuver better. You see, this is Apple's maneuver. It's a treatment of BPPV. So five position, E, P, L, E, Y. Five position is Apple maneuver treatment BPPV. Advanced level question for INI, CT, beta. If Apple maneuver does not help, then what is the other option we have? Cement maneuver. For INI, CT, Ames question. If, if Apple maneuver does not help, then other option, beta. Cement maneuver, beta. And if cement maneuver also doesn't help and patient had chronic BPPV, then what is the name of excise beta? Brand Darof excise is beta. For INICD level beta, if apple maneuver does not help, then cement maneuver beta. If cement maneuver does not help and you have to do manage a chronic BPPV, then you do brand Darof excises. And if this doesn't help beta, then you do finally surgery. And the surgery is called singular neurectomy. Okay, if these excises also do not help, and patient had chronic BPPV and he's getting handicapped because of that. Then you do final surgery, singular neurectomy, because singular now supplies the posterior semicircular canal. Another question of your, you know, INICT, PG, what is the nerve supply of posterior canal? Is the singular nerve beta? So sing most commonly involved canal is posterior canal beta. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. Now look at this question. Which statement is not true about? Please don't miss the word not true about BPPV beta. Not true about. Dick Solpike is diagnostic test? Yes. Otoconia migrate to posterior canal? Yes. There is hearing loss of this condition. Wrong. BPPV is only vertigo beta. Vertigo. Vertigo. Only vertigo with nausea, vomiting may be there. No hearing loss, no tinnitus beta. Apple maneuver is therapeutic. Answer this question is C beta. Answer this question is C. Okay. Now, the last clinical vignette of this, this session beta. And this is particularly for NEED PG and INICT beta. INICT. And of course, the future next paper also beta. Okay. Okay, fine. This topic is not as an FMG. This is a very popular topic for NEED PG INICT beta. Let us diagnose it. 29 year old patient with the thick nasal mucin and the heterogeneous nasal polypi on CT scan. The keyword is heterogeneous beta. Heterogeneous nasal polypi on CT scan. What is the diagnosis? Anybody? Anybody who is there beta who is targeting NEED PG, FMG, uh, sorry, NEED PG INICT? Can you tell me what is the diagnosis of this patient beta? Everybody, can you tell me? Thick nasal mucin, heterogeneous nasal polypi, CT scan. What is the possible diagnosis? Anybody who has mind beta? This is allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. It is the most common type of fungal sinusitis which we see beta. AFRS beta. Allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. AFRS beta. Now, let us few words about AFRS beta. AFRS is seen in immunocompetent patient beta. There's fungal infection which you see. Mucormycosis is seen in the immunocompromised patient, COVID-19, steroid use patient, uh, and, uh, okay, fine. this is immunocompromised patient, and this is typically the type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. Type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. Okay, fine. Allergy, right? allergy. which type of allergic response? Type 1. Right? There are two clinical findings in the AFRS. Right? Allergic nasal mucin and typical nasal polypi. Right? In the nose, there is a thick mucin. Right? It's a thick mucin, and it's a peanut butter. Right? In the nose, there's a very thick mucin and the peanut butter kind of appearance. If you take a drop of that and see under microscope, you will see fungal hyphae, eosinophils, and sharked laden crystal. Beta. AFRS beta, allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. This is fungal. 
and this is allergy with it. there are two things over here allergic also and fungal also with okay fine. so two finding are number one is the first is very thick mucin over here like this which under microscope shows a lot of fungal hyphae and eosinophils because it's allergic fungal rancid so two things are there the nasal polypi are fungal polypi this is the fungal debris in the polyp bitter can you see if you do ct scan it cannot be homogeneous bitter why this will look different this will look different bitter that is why the ct scan shows what bitter heterogeneous or double density nasal polypi the star question bitter heterogeneous or double density nasal polypi why look at the polyp bitter the polyp is not one polyp got fungal debris into that so if you do the ct scan of this patient this is the star question of need pg inct bitter can you see this polyp bitter this is normal not a homogeneous polyp please see this is a more dense than this one bitter this is called heterogeneous or double density nasal polypi on ct scan this is typical of allergic fungal rhinosinusitis afrs bitter afrs okay fine afrs so lastly can you tell me this question of the inct need pg all are true about afrs except except allergic mucin with eosinophils and sharpened crystals correct type 1 allergy reaction correct homogeneous nasal polypi is written wrong it's not homogeneous beta it is heterogeneous beta it is heterogeneous or double density beta okay and can be seen in immunocompromised patient yes my dear friend mucormycosis is seen in immunocompromised patient but allergic fungal sensitivity is seen in immunocompetent patient beta okay fine answer this question is c beta okay c okay guys this was a you know a brief you know clinical thursday which we wanted to celebrate with you to make sure you understand that how at doctorials we are actually trying to you know sharpen the already bright minds of our medicals with us maybe imgs maybe need pg people maybe fmg people are you from aims delhi jipper pondicherry whichever medical college you are from we have a faith everyone has got a unique brain wonderful brain that's why you are here in this you know uh, you know the the goal of all of you is to become good doctor with us and the idea of dr rails is to create a content in such a way that you become conceptually very clear about the topic you can create integration you can create differentiation in your mind and whenever the mcq come in the paper you are able to think like a very you know like sound clinician that's what this the clinical thursday is all about that's what we are trying to do at dr with a lot of you know beautiful faculty team we have and everyone is passionate to make sure that our younger medicals should become future you know very 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 you know successful and very happy and very you know like talented professional so thank you very much and uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to each one of you to you know be with me for this 50 minutes and i hope this session you know was useful to you thanks a lot guys thank you very much take care if you have any comment any question please write in the chat box below i'll definitely reply to that thanks a lot